So today I'm going to be talking about the most critical thing when it comes to bream fishing, and that's location. So keep watching, I'm going to give you my 10 top tips on how to find bream. If you like these videos, please subscribe, hit the like button below. Well, I suppose the first thing we have to make sure is that the fish we want to catch are actually in the venue we're fishing. Sounds simple, but um, so often with bream, I've followed up false trails in the past where particularly talking to carp fishing friends, they've, they've caught bream by accident, returned them generally without weighing, but they've, they've come up with some ridiculous weights on them. And it's, it's very easy to do if you compare a bream to a carp. A carp's a lot chunkier, a lot thicker in the body. So if you're used to looking at 15, 20 pound carp, and then you look at a bream that's 10, 12 pound, it's going to look enormous. So it's very easy for, for anglers to misjudge them. So I'm always dead, dead careful about the venues I fish and I'm sure before I start putting any effort into them that the fish I want to catch are actually in there. Now there's loads of ways you can get information and there's big bream all over the country these days so you shouldn't be too far away from a venue that's got some form but please make sure before you put any effort in that the fish you want to catch are actually in there. So what sort of fishery should you be looking for? Well, bream come in all sorts of shapes and sizes really, from the real mega fish, you know, of maybe 16 pound plus, um, on the real headbanger waters generally. I mean, fish like that generally get to that size because they've got an excess of food and a lack of competition from other fish. So you're not gonna be fishing waters where you've got masses of fish and you're gonna be catching a great deal. At the other end of the spectrum, there's quite a lot of venues out there with big heads of fish between eight and maybe 12, 13 pound, where you can get lots of bites and build up your knowledge of bream fishing, try different rigs, try different baits, get some confidence. And if you're new to bream fishing, especially specimen bream fishing, they're the kind of venues that I think you should really start on. I mean, I did a lot of fishing on, on places like that, catching you know many, many doubles when I was younger. And it was a great founding really to, to go onto the harder waters. Because once you're on there, you need to be 100% sure that what you're using is working and then it really does then come down to location and making sure you're getting on the right spots where the fish are. And you can start building up a picture about a lake um, even before you start fishing it. Get online and Google it, see if there's any information, if there's a Facebook page where maybe where there's some information on there. It's look for pictures online of the lake to get a feel for it at different times of the year. I find Google Earth a brilliant resource to use because you can get maps of the lake, you can print them up or trace them and, and so you've got to start when you come to do your plumbing. Um, you might be able to see islands, bars, weed beds on uh, Google Earth and it will give you a good start before you even start fishing. If you're going to spend any amount of time on a lake then you're going to want to plumb it up and get a good idea of what the underwater features are like. Like I say, bream aren't going to be distributed evenly and as we'll come on to there's some certain types of feature that I think they tend to follow. So I'll get on with a marker float, just a straight lead so I can fill the bottom, maybe a deeper fish finder so I can get a quick idea of the depths and draw a map of the lake. Try and pick up any features, take some uh, marker sticks with you so you can actually mark it out and get the distances and get as much of that laid down before you start fishing as you can. It's a great job to do in the winter um, but it may be that the venue is quite a long way and you have to do it when you're actually fishing. But generally speaking, if I can do as much as that preparation work before I actually start fishing, then so much the better. Now, if there's one feature in a swim that I'm looking for when I'm bream fishing, it's harder spots. And that's normally when you pull a marker float back across, you can either feel it comes a little bit easier, that it's hard clay or smooth silt, or it could be bumpy and that's generally it's gravel under silt because if you're using a marker set up with maybe a three or four ounce lead on it and you're pulling it across the bottom that actually creates a furrow and it's quite surprising how far it will dig in and you'll feel the gravel underneath the silt even though there's a fine layer of silt on top and if I can find a spot like that it can be really really good and the bream do seem to like to feed on those kind of areas and that goes back really to some of my early sort of bream fishing experiences for better bream um, and one trip in particular when I, I, I drove down and fished Larford Lake uh, in Worcestershire for a couple of nights and again I, I fished a swim and didn't really have any great 
Um, differences in depth or any great features, but the one thing I could find was a seam of gravel about 45 yards out that ran down the lake. And um, one rod was put on that, one rod fished a bit shorter um, in the silt just to try and mix it up and see what uh, if it made any difference. And it was the, the rod on that harder patch that pro produced the only bream of the session, which just turned out to be my first double, but also the other bites from carp and even as a still water chub I caught that, that trip as well. So again, that's kind of set me in good stead really. And on a lot of venues I've fished, those doesn't have to be a big difference in depth or anything, but those kind of areas are the ones that I'm looking for. Now, as we've talked about, bream do like to patrol in lakes and they're not going to be randomly moving around. Again, they'll follow well-worn paths really around the venue um, to get from the areas maybe where they're resting to where they want to feed. And if you can find those areas, you've got an opportunity to catch them as they move through, especially on the more prolific venues. And so, again, look for, look for other kind of features that they're going to follow. This could be the edge of weed beds. It could be um, gravel bars, island margins, just variations in depth. And often they'll be in the slightly deeper water, just off the side of a bar rather than on top of it. Um, and again, it's a nice area, it's quite a safe area for a bream to patrol along that area when it's slightly deeper. Nothing can kind of attack them from, from underneath, so they're going to be fairly safe. Now if there's one thing that I try and avoid, because the bream avoid it when I'm out fishing for them, that's weed. Bream definitely don't like dense weed and it can be difficult on gravel pits in summer which can get extremely weedy but um, if you can avoid the weed so much the better. A good example of this was St Ives Lagoon that I used to fish it was quite a prolific bream water and um, on there the swim that I, or the area of the lake that the bank that, that I tended to fish had three distinct bars at different distances during the late spring early summer before the weed got too bad the third bar at about 80 yards was definitely where the bream used to hang out and was would provide, produce probably two or three times as many bites as the, the other two bars. As time went on, the weed would get worse, and actually, it would get the, the third bar would be the one that weeded up first and become almost unfishable, really. But the great thing with that area was that the first bar and the area around the first bar generally was the last one to weed up, and some years it didn't weed up at all. And it created a brilliant motorway, really, for the bream to move from the main area of the lake along that bank without having to overcome any weed beds and have to like come up in the water to go over them or anything like that. They could patrol around, find their own route. And so the swim that I tended to fish in the end was the one right at the end of that motorway really where it butted up against a big weed bed. And I could put three rods on that first bar, spread out, one on the bar and then one either side of it. And it was the area where the bream would patrol in and it might take me a bit lo longer in the evening to get a bite but once I did the bream would definitely hang about there for longer um, before moving back off into the main area of the lake in the morning and again it was a it was a brilliant uh, lesson learned that I've taken to harder venues in the, in the years gone since then find those areas where they're not too weedy and if I can find an area that's relatively shallow you know the kind of depth that the fish fish normally like on that lake but without too much weed then that's definitely the ones where I'll concentrate my efforts because I think that's where the fish are likely to be. So there's been quite a lot of research done in the past on bream movements especially in rivers rather than lakes to be honest. Um, you generally using radio tracking which is a great way to see where they go and the old theory about um, patrol routes it does seem to hold some credibility really in that um, on rivers particularly the fish will seem to have areas that they prefer during the day when they're generally resting up and not doing a great deal and then they'll move normally upstream um, around dusk time to feed overnight and then move back down just before dawn. Do they do the same thing in lakes? Probably in, in some venues uh, more than others I would say and I think again it probably comes down to the number of mouths there are to feed. Um, and the amount of food in the venue. So if you've got a lot of bream and big shoals of them and perhaps not such a rich venue then they're not going to be able to find enough food in one area to satisfy all the fish. So they're going to be constantly on the move looking for more food, grazing as they go and moving around. And those kind of venues are great because the bream are hungry, 
they're going to make use of any food resource that you put in front of them um, and so they're going to be relatively easy to catch on a wide range of baits. I think that contrasts markedly with the real hard low stocked venues where you've generally got very few fish and an awful lot of natural food for them and they're almost like different creatures on those kind of venues where there's just so much food for them that they can choose to be really picky and I think sometimes they can get absolutely focused on natural food things like small snails, caddis larvae, even bloodworm, even for big fish. And that can make them really, really difficult to catch at times, especially in the midsummer, when everything's blooming like mad and there's just masses and masses of food for them. Um, but really, again, comes down to trying to work out what kind of venue you're fishing. Is it somewhere where you're expecting lots of fish or somewhere that's much, much harder? Build that into your campaign and how you tackle it. Now we've talked about patrol routes and I'll tell you a problem with patrol routes when you're trying to look for fish and especially look for fish rolling. Now obviously we're going to be watching the water probably from dawn uh, and dusk in particular because that's when we're expecting to see the bream rolling more. But if the bream are moving around especially at night following this patrol route or just moving to a different area to feed after dark from where they've been resting during the day then if you're seeing them rolling at dawn and dusk that might not be the area where they're going to be at night in fact it could be quite a long way from it so yes it's always good to watch the water and, and see where the fish are showing but don't necessarily think that is the be all and end all of it and that's where the fish are going to be feeding at night and the swims and areas that you want to be wanting to fish on more prolific venues you can generally see a pattern and the fish will probably start rolling an hour or so before it gets too difficult to see what's going on. On the more prolific venues, you'll often see that the bream will start rolling maybe an hour or so before last light. And you might be lucky enough to be able to watch them and see which direction they're moving in. Again, that can be a much, much better indicator of where the bream are going to end up after dark and where you're going to have the best chance of catching them than seeing them rolling just in one area in daylight. And the same, if you get up early in the morning and see the fish going in the other direction, which sounds a bit ludicrous, but I have you know, definitely seen it on occasions, then you can have a really good idea of where the bream are going to at night and where they're most likely to be feeding. Now there's one tip on location, especially on more difficult venues that I can give you, that's more important and I'd say I'd put more effort into than everything else put together and that's line bites. If I'm getting line bites, it might only be two or three a night on a difficult venue with not a lot of stock of fish in it, then that's a brilliant indicator that the fish are there. And again, understand a little bit more about what the fish are doing and where they're going by the time during the night or during the evening when you start getting line bites. If it's on dusk, again, the fish are probably moving through and if they then stop in dark, you're probably not on the feeding spot. You're probably a little bit away from it the fish have passed you by. If you get line bites later in the night, brilliant. Chances are you're in the right area and the fish are going to stay there for a while. Now, one thing I will say is that line bites can give you a bit of a false impression about the number of fish that are in front of you. Um, and I've learned this on a couple of lakes, especially with that spring fishing when the mouths are in close. And I'm fairly certain there's not many fish about. And on two or three occasions I can think of where I've been getting line bites at fairly regular intervals and then I've caught a bream, generally a male, and the line bites have stopped completely and that's been it, no more for the rest of the night. And there's possibly other reasons for it, but I've certainly put that down to the fact that I've had one fish patrolling up and down in front of me and I've caught it and that's it. There's no more fish out there to give me line bites. I'm thinking about it, I now used my two or three rods that I'm fishing with as a bit of an indicator to um, um, how many fish are in front of me by how I'm getting the line bites. So let me give you an example. I've got three rods out, get a line bite on the right hand rod followed by one on the left hand, uh, middle rod and then one on the left or maybe one on the right and then one on the left. With maybe a minute, two minutes between them, maybe longer. But there's a definite pattern to the, the line bites which kind of indicates a fish moving through. Now that says to me there's not many fish there and there's maybe could be one fish it could be a small number of them moving through 
from right to left. In that in that case, it could be the other way, obviously. Um, but it's a good indicator that there's not a massive amount of fish in front of you, and maybe they're not staying in front of you. The other situation is where I'm getting random line bites, where I maybe get one on the right hand rod, and one on the left, another one on the right, and they're, they're fairly uh, uh, closely interspersed. Now that suggests to me that there's a shoal of fish out there, and fish are moving around a bit more randomly, uh, and there's more fish there. So again, you can start to build up a little bit of a picture and a little bit of an idea, and it might be not be quite right, but you can start to get a little bit of an idea about how many fish are out in front of you and what they're doing. Now, the other thing to bear in mind with line bites is obviously the fish are bumping into the line. So your, your rig and your bait is actually beyond where the fish are. Now, it could be a couple of feet, could be several metres, several yards difference. So if I'm getting lots of line bites and not picking up fish, and as we've seen on the underwater film with the bream, they don't seem to mind bumping into the line, so it's not really going to spook them. But if I start getting lots of line bites and no pickups, I wind one of the rods in, set it maybe three or four metres shorter than where it was, and put it back out. And again, if I'm still getting line bites on that rod, I wind it back in, drop it a bit shorter, drop it a bit shorter until the line bites stop. And that gives you a good indication of where in the swim the fish are. And again, a couple of times I can think I've done this and it's been a brilliant way to actually get um, the location of, of where the fish are right. And I've been fishing beyond them and by bringing a rig back, I've picked up a couple of fish by being in the right area. Now bream, even on uh, venues that are well stocked, aren't going to be in the same areas and using the same patrol routes all year round. It does vary, particularly during the spring in the lead up to spawning. And we find some interesting behaviour at that time of year, I think. Generally speaking, bream will spawn on, on plant material, so you're looking for weed beds, big areas of rushes and reeds, and areas of the lake that are relatively shallow. Um, I would say probably less than about 8 to 10 feet deep is going to be ideal for spawning, leading up into, say, lots of vegetation. And what I've found, um, and there's a bit of scientific evidence to back this up as well, is that the bream will generally um, start to appear in April. Um, and generally, and not always, but in my experience, it's the male fish that turn up first. And again, one of the old rules that um, normally applies to bream fishing, which is to fish further out from, goes out of the window at that time of year because they're coming up to those marginal, well, normally marginal areas to spawn. Um, and so the males will turn up first and often in ones and twos and male bream can be really territorial so you, you'll find that um, very often you won't catch many fish that time of year they'll be very biased towards males and often you'll just catch one maybe two in the night and I think that's because the fish are staking out the territory I've actually watched them um, in the lead up to spawning and they're really active up and down the margin constantly bullying other fish out of the way, especially other male bream. And it's no wonder that they're covered in uh, spawning tubicles because they're quite aggressive male bream at that time of year. So you're not fishing for lots of fish. The bulk of the, the shoals, the females, probably going to be somewhere else. But it's a good indication that you're in the right area for a few weeks time when they come in up to preparation for spawning. Now spawning normally takes place, um, I've found, especially in the southern half of the country, around the end of May. Um, it's pretty much fixed really. I think it's a combination of water temperature and day length. And day length is the critical one for the development of the eggs in the females and for them to start moving into those shallower areas. And this is a great time to, to fish for them because they're quite catchable um, and the females in particular are going to be at their top weights. It could be a big bream at that time of year, it could be a couple of pounds heavier than it is post spawning through the summer. But it does put some, some, some uh, extra focus on location because they're not going to be where they normally be. You've got to find those areas where they're going to be in the pre-spawn. Um, and again, shallows, lots of weed beds is the thing to do. And at that time, at that time of year, I wouldn't worry too much about pre-baiting for them, even on better stocked venues, because um, they're going to be in those areas anyway. And if you can put something in front of them that they're going to eat, they're going to have it and they're probably only going to be there for a few days so there's no point in putting a pre-baiting campaign in because most of it's going to go to waste. 
I must admit, pre-baiting isn't something I do a great deal these days. I've done it in the past on uh, well-stocked waters and it's worked brilliantly and I'll talk about that in a sec. But again, the harder the venue you get, the lower the stock, the less likely they are to change their behaviour a little bit to make use of the amount, of, you know, that extra food that you're putting in. Um, you, in my experience, you can't move fish around with pre-baiting. So you re again, location is key. You're looking to find the patrol routes, find the areas where the fish are, and then bait up there. And there's two reasons really to bait up. One is to try and keep them in the area a bit longer uh, so you can catch more of them. And the other one is to get them onto a specific food. So again, I would look to, to pre-bait with a relatively cheap bait, not something that's expensive. Um, so I can put quite a bit of it in and, and it's not going to cost me a fortune. So stuff like sweet corn and maize is perfect. Boilies, if you're looking at more money, but they do last a bit longer on the bottom um, and can be made to be a bit more effective. Easier to fish on the rigs um, sometimes. But they're the kind of baits on hungry waters that I tend to use. On the harder venues, you tend to be going but more onto natural baits like casters, worm, maggot, stuff like that. So your opportunities to pre-bait and the cost of pre-baiting is going to escalate quite, uh, quite a lot. So it's something I tend to do less. And because those baits, those casters, those uh, worms, maggots, are all small and they're kind of mimicking the natural food, I think there's less reason to, to pre-bait with them because you know, you're mimicking naturals. So the bream should have a fair idea of what that is food anyway. And if you're in the right area and they're, they're hungry, you're going to catch them. Now, what I tend not to do, again, because it's just wasted cost, I think, is to pre-bait with lots of ground bait. Certainly when I film ground bait or, or baited areas the day after or the night or uh, the morning after, um, baiting up in the evening, most of the ground bait is gone, whether there's been fish there or not. Because of the undertow, it's just disappeared. So save yourself some money. Um, don't ball it in with ground bait unless you're just going to use something cheap like layers mash and brown crumb because uh, I think you're pretty much wasting your time. You're much better off just using a spod. It's a bit more effort, but spod out. Those bigger baits that are going to stick there, like sweet corn, maize, mini boilies, stuff like that, if you've got some going spare, and keep it to that. Now, the bream season can be quite long. It can really go from late March all the way into November in a, in a mild autumn. But there's a couple of key periods when I tend to fish for them. The first one really kicks off towards the end of April and runs up until the end of May when they start spawning. And that time of year, the fish are in top condition and top weights, and it's your best time really to, to catch a real big fish. Natural food's fairly low at that time of the year, and as long as you can locate them, especially on the really hard venues, then your chances of catching a real whacker are probably the best they are all year. Through the summer, it can be quite tough because natural food is going to explode. Um, the fish are going to be feeding quite well, but the high water temperatures can mean that uh, the feeding periods are quite short and in the middle of the night um, and not ideal for catching. But then the next key period for me really is, is around September um, through to the first frosts, um, which can be sort of late November, even December these days. Brilliant time to catch them. The natural foods gradually kind of falling away and the fish are feeding up for winter. They've recovered from spawning in good conditions, maybe not the massive weights that they are in the spring, but again for bigger catches of fish that can be the best time of year of all. And the fish are going to be a lot more predictable in the autumn, uh, they're going to follow patrol routes, they're going to be feeding in the same swims night after night sometimes and so if you can locate them it can be a good period because that effort is going to really pay off and you're going to have some good rewards. And so that's my tips on locating bream. It might sound a bit complicated but really if you follow you know some simple rules it's dead easy and the same things apply to all the venues I've ever fished really. Um, obviously the less stock of fish you've got in front of you and the bigger the venue the harder location can be. But at the same time, the rewards can really be there and you might end up with a real monster. One thing I would say is it's always better to start off um, on an easier venue that's well stocked and gradually build up through your fishing career onto the harder waters with bigger fish. You might go on a hard venue and catch a real whacker straight away, but where does your fishing go over then? So 
go on to an easier venue where you're going to be catching those low doubles, maybe eight pounders, nine pounders, the odd double, um, but on a regular basis. Because on those kind of venues, you're really going to learn the, the tactics, the methods and the baits that work and build up your confidence. So when you do go on to the hard venues, you don't have to worry about your rigs. You don't have to worry about what baits you're using. You've got 100% confidence. Don't change them. Just spend all your time really concentrating on location and making sure you're in the right areas at the right times. And that, as in so much fishing, is what it's all about. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this film. If you stuck with me this long, thanks very much. You've done really well. Uh, there's some other bream films in the playlist. Have a look at those. And why not give me a follow on Facebook or Instagram. Just have a look for Paul Garner Fishing and you'll find me. So thanks very much for watching and we'll see you again soon.